Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that you know a lot more about the details of this than I do, and therefore I don't think I can add much to your general knowledge uh, of the specifics. So what I would propose to do, since I've been asked to introduce the, uh, the seminar, is to look at an overview, look at a framework within which everything else might be placed. And this is going to be essentially, if you like, a bird's eye view of where we came from, why we're here, and what we are specifically doing. And so it's, so to speak, to bring us to the point of departure. Montesquieu was a French philosopher and historian of the 18th century who fell out of fashion in the 19th century, largely because his theories were regarded as being uh, unscientific. He came back into favour in the 20th century largely because he actually saw the world as it was. And there can be far too much abstraction in relation to scientific entities. The apple falls whether Newton is there or not, whether he knows that he doesn't know about the law of gravity. It just happens. And that Montesquieu saw the world in that sense. And that's the real sense in which the 20th century sees the world. Montesquieu also believed, and Berkeley was supported by Burke later on, that there are certain fundamentals within, the hum within human nature that in fact continually recur, and that while this is not any kind of uh, <clears throat> preemption in relation to a direction or preordination in relation to the human race, the human instincts are such that they're tending in a direction. And he believed that those directions could be traced through the events of history. He saw, in fact, history itself as being incidental, but he saw these events as finding their way, a little bit like a captain steering a ship in a storm, that he knows what direction he wants to go, He's pushed and buffeted by the waves, and he reorientates himself all the time back onto course. Montesquieu and Burke both held that theory, which was given credit again in the 20th century. And I think it forms a very useful basis, because adding to that, Montesquieu also said that in order to understand what we are and who we are, we must understand where we came from. And the only way we can understand where we came from is to set what he called an outer frame, and you must set the outer frame as widely as possible, at the widest possible limit. Now, in that context, throughout the development of Western society, there have been two major perceptions which form a dialectic, which in fact the tension of which gives us our culture as we are today. One was what is referred to as the classic theory, in which human beings are elements within an ordered society. They serve a society. Society is man-made and man-regulated and continually perfected and can achieve perfection. And that the duty of every individual is to form a part or element of that society. That is the classic view. The world is fixed on solid ground and that it's an ordered place and that man is comfortable in his world and God is comfortable in his heaven. And that that was the classical theory. Rousseau developed, if you like, an alternative to that. And that alternative was referred to as the romantic theory in which the only thing that is static in the world is the individual, and that there is a flux of events around him. And that, that flux of events is arbitrary, but the individual remains static, and that the individual perfects himself or herself on the basis of those changes. So chance delivers you a hand, you're played a hand by chance, and it's up to you to form yourself as an individual in relation to that hand. That in fact, any perception of the world being a static and stable place is in fact walking on very thin ice under which there is fire and that occasionally that crevice is open and people disappear into it uh, and that that can happen to anybody and that that is the very nature of the world we live in. That was the romantic theory and those two theories continually opposed each other throughout the 19th, uh, mainly throughout the 19th century. Coming into the 20th century we have merged these and we actually see that they're both correct. Back to Montesquieu that in fact there are no separate abstractions. Abstractions are only convenient ways of seeing the world. That the realities are there whether we abstract them or not. And that in reality we're a complicated version of both of those two theories put together. And that this is what leads to an interesting point that the minister made when he said that the president has corrected him continually in relation to calling customers citizens. He's absolutely right. Because a citizen in fact represents the creature of society. It is the creature which has rights and duties. And that citizenship is a privilege. And there always was a privilege. And this, in a way, within Montesquieu's frame, is where I want to start looking 
at how we come to the Disability Act. Now, it's a long journey, and I'm going to go very quickly through it. I'm only going to mark the major stopping points as we go. But there is a direct line, if you accept Montesquieu's principle, that there are certain fundamental instincts that the human race has that will continually recur and revert, because the human race is the captain steering the ship. So the ship will continually find its way back onto certain courses. And that one of these courses relates to citizenship. And that if we, take, if we take the earliest starting point of our frame, it is actually the foundation of Europe, the creation of Europe. Europe was created in reality in the year 480 BC at the Battle of Salamis, when in fact a small group of Celts who had, who had perched themselves on the edge of the Persian Empire broke free from the Persian Empire and challenged it. It took it on militarily as a tiny, it was, it was, it was David and Goliath, it took on a tiny, a tiny group took on an enormous empire and defeated it. And out of that came what we refer to as Greece. Now, Greece was idealized in the 19th century largely by the German Romantics, uh, and that our perception of it today as this perfect place is, in fact, a distorted perception, but nonetheless a useful one. And that within that, certain things did happen. And Aristotle did come to one fundamental principle, which is the principle on which we are proceeding. And that is he, when he said, Every person is born to be a citizen. That's an extraordinarily ex important concept. And this is the one that tracks itself through. This is the one that Burke and Montesquieu would say are instinctive within the human race. And what does it mean? If you take the romantic theory of the individual being tested by the circumstances of the world, this is that everybody has a right to be an individual. Your birthright, that which comes with the process of being born, is in fact to develop yourself to the greatest possible capacity and to have access to all the opportunities to do so. Once you have access to those opportunities, it's up to you as to what you do with them. You can sit back and do nothing with them, that's your choice, but you must have that choice. And what Aristotle indicated, that in, in, in his concept of society, that every person is born to be a citizen, is that everybody has to have that right. And from this, we get the concept, the Periclean concept of Greek democracy. Greek democracy. And for a short time, we have this, what Winkelmann creates as this ideal picture of a society, which of course never existed. Now, what existed there was 5% of the population supported by 95% of the population who were slaves, people of no right, and people who in fact were not even treated as people. So that there was a whole body and group outside, in fact the majority, didn't even get the status of being people, never mind citizens. So yes, the theory of citizenship was there. The principle of democracy, which literally comes from the Greek word demos, meaning the people, so it's the rule by the people, that was there. And in a place called the Picts on the side of the Acropolis in Athens, a natural amphitheater cut into the rock, the people met. There were something like 2,000 of them. All, of the other all the other population of Athens were slaves. They had no rights at all. So it nonetheless provides us with a very useful concept and a useful idea. It's great clarity in that idea, which was perfected later on. And it is an idea that probably fits more comfortably into the idea of the romantics rather than into the classical frame. And to a large extent, this is why it was dismissed and Montesquieu was dismissed in the 18th century, which of course was the post-Renaissance period of the height of classicism. So that if in fact we take that whole uh, development it disappears largely under the tyrannies of the Roman Empire and then under the barbarian invasions. All of this disappears and the world becomes a disordered place as far as the rights, so to speak, or identified rights of citizens are, 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 are relevant. And that it's not in, we don't see it really emerging again until the French Revolution. And that in the French Revolution, it's interesting that the banners that the French armies carried across Europe had the word equality. It was liberty, fraternity, and equality. And liberty and fraternity are embodied in the concept of equality. Equality was the key word here. And that's the word that will track us through. Because if you come back to Aristotle's principle of every person is born to be a citizen, then in fact, what does that mean? They are to be given equal opportunities. Now, it's a mistake to say they are to be equal. They are to be treated as equal, which is a very different thing to being equal. What they do with their equality is irrelevant. That's up to them. If we track this idea through, we see, we start off by seeing a relatively small aristocratic group who are in fact the aristocrats, again literally aristos is the Greek word for the best and krasos to rule, those who are ruled by the best, those who consider themselves to be the best. 
these were hereditary, if you like, hereditary princes and so forth, and their and their their, their larger families, who in fact were tyrants uh, in in uh, a controlled society. Out of this then comes the French Revolution, which challenges this, uh, and which opens this idea that the people themselves have a right, and that their 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 method of achieving it was primitive and that nobody could support what the French Revolution was and what it did. But the ideas that underlay it, while they died quickly under Napoleon's re reinstatement of French empire, largely because it was an idea that was before its time, the idea had been expressed, and it was important that it had been expressed. It appears again in England in the Reform Acts of 1832. This is by parliamentary decision. Remember that after the Civil War in England, England decided effectively never to have another war internally. Everything would be done by, in an ordered fashion, but Parliament was now in control and not the Crown. So that in fact, Parliament then, being the ruling body within England in 1832, extended the franchise to property owners of o holding properties of a certain value. And that what that did effectively was it brought a whole group of people, not yet the people, but a group of people in who now had a say. They elected a government and that that government had to in fact respond to their needs. Progressively this widens, I won't go through the widening of it, but it widens out and that until in 1918 you get the, uh, the, the universal suffrage uh, and you get for the first time, you get women admitted to being voters. They are actually accepted as people. Up to 1882 the uh, Married Women's Property Act uh, limited the rights of women who are married to own property, they still had the status of a chattel, and that's as recently as my grandmother's lifetime in 1882. Uh, now, all of this changes, of course, radically with the, with the First World War, and the First World War is the first big instance, if you like, which converts England, and when converts largely the world, into a real democracy, because after it, they are never going to trust dynasties again. They are now effectively democratic governments, and the people are ruling. Women have proved their worth during the, their abilities during the First World War, when in fact the male population was largely destroyed, or a large part of it was destroyed, or badly injured. And as a result of that, they weren't going back. The suffrage movement in 1918 then establishes. So our circle widens. So we start off by having a small group of aristocrats. We then have the property owners at a certain level. The property owning, if you like, a franchise increases throughout the 19th century. 20th century, we have women admitted to it. We then have had the American Civil War in 1866. Uh, that ostensibly was fought on the basis of the elimination of slavery. It didn't succeed for political reasons. The southern states had to be excluded from the constitutional rights uh, of, of, of colored people. And that as a result, this didn't return to the agenda until the 1960s. Uh, when under Martin Luther King, a, a new, a new uh, if you like, resurgence came about and that at this stage, as a result, the color, the idea of being colored was admitted as equ equal with everybody else, and that equality extended now to embrace the idea of race as well as gender, so that you had, you had gender and race moving outwards all the time. So what you see is an ever-widening circle, and each time, what do they get? They get the right to be a citizen, and that is what a citizen does. A citizen forms the government. A citizen is a person, according to Aristotle's definition, is a person who governs himself through the process, through a process of government. And these are now people who have a right to appoint a government, the right of franchise. So this is moving out all the time. So we now have a world that's becoming ever more inclusive in terms of rights, and that those who represent it must themselves if you like, reflect that representation in the laws that they pass. If we come to laws themselves, we're a common law jurisdiction, which means that we grow by precedent, we go by custom and tradition. The courts slowly look backwards all the time and make decisions on new points by looking back at old points. That's the common law. We introduce a statutory overlayer to that in which our elected parliaments can expressly change the law. And it's a little bit like saying you have the jar of water, that's the common law, you drop the stone into it, that's the statute. The stone displaces the water and takes its place as to the extent to which it displaces the water. So we get a combination of statutory and common law together, and that's what our system is. Now, all the time, it's open to those whom we elect to introduce statutes. The types of statutes that they introduce can be positive or negative. They can be negative in the sense for saying that thou shalt not do something, and we have thou shalt not discriminate. Positive is thou shalt do something, 
and we will do something. And that all our legislation divides into being either positive or negative. It also divides into being rights-based and duty-based. Rights-based legislation is to give a citizen a right that the citizen can pursue and recover on foot of that right. A duty-based is that somebody is assigned to carry out a duty and that there will be an overseeing power that will ensure that they carry out the duty and that the penalties for failing to carry out the duty usually will be of a public nature. They will be a fine or imprisonment or whatever, which is the public making a decision as opposed to rights. So that statutes are, are rights and duty based. Now, if we go very quickly to the American position, after the Vietnam War, we had, we had two wars, the First and Second World War, there was enormous devastation and disability followed from these. There were generations blighted by these wars. But there was no e economic base to accommodate them afterwards. So they were just largely dismissed. And in Russia, I had seen uh, the veterans from Afghanistan with limbs missing, begging in the streets. They were still in that primitive state in the 1990s when I was there. They were still in that primitive state that, in fact, you found after the First and Second World War of economic disadvantaging of those who had been injured in the process of fighting for their country. There wasn't, there wasn't any thought or room for them. So what we, have, what we had after Vietnam, however, they, at least they had the glory of having, if you like, patriotically uh, had been victors of their country. But after Vietnam, Vietnam was a failure. Americans don't like failure. And Vietnam was a failure at every level. They had to withdraw from Vietnam. And that withdrawing from it, when the veterans came back, they weren't appreciated. They were, they were largely ignored on the basis that Americans do not celebrate failure. And that as a result of that, they became very angry. And that in 1973, there was a first act introduced, a Rehabilitation Act introduced, when in fact, disability provisions had to be made to give equality of citizenship to the Vietnam veterans on any projects that were funded from federal funds. And this is the first crack, if you like, that one sees in, the, in, in relation to the disability. The argument is going to be that disability becomes the next group that are admitted, if you like, to the, 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 fam the family of equality, as they have gone through where, uh, how the different groups came into it. So this, this is about bringing the disability group within that, within that cycle and giving them the status of citizenship. And that in the, uh, un, under the um, Americans for Disabilities Act, which came as a result of the Vietnam generation, had now come up, filtered up through society. Because America, in fact, was, conscription was right across the board in America, all classes were conscripted, and all classes were injured, all classes were rejected when they returned. So as a result, in every area of society, you had this filtering up uh, into, the, into the layers of society of people with experience of Vietnam. There was a high level of disability in this, and they formed a very strong disability lobby. In 1990, the Americans took a very sensible view of the whole thing. They simply said, we have a problem. And Americans are very good at solving problems. They're not hugely good at thinking things out in advance, but they're very good at solving problems. So they said, we have the problem. The problem is we have a revenue negative group of people, people who are drawing down disability benefit. And the reason they're drawing it down is because they can't work and they can't become revenue productive. So why don't we actually make, them, make places of work accessible to them so they can go and work and then we can tax them? So instead of, instead of them deriving a benefit from us, why don't we derive a benefit from them? And in the process, give them equality uh, by giving them access. And the Americans with Disabilities Act then set about creating an infrastructure and a society in which there was accessibility Primarily, its objectives were economic, but nonetheless, it would achieve in the process if like a social medium in which everybody could have equal access. They then set about, first of all, the state would pay the cost of the public infrastructure, but the private sector would have to carry, carry the cost of like, the workplace. And the Americans with Disabilities Act also recognized in its words that, in fact, there was a class of people called the, those disabled, and they were socially, educationally, uh, at education and economically disadvantaged, and that it would be the objective of the act to change that policy within society. And the Americans are very good again at inventing words, and they invented language, and the importance of the language they invented is it's the language that we use today in our own, in our own circumstances. They brought this idea of mainstreaming, the, this concept of people being washed up on the banks. We'll get them back into the mainstream, and when they're flowing in the mainstream, they become revenue productive, uh, and this American practicality underlying it all the time, they also become people with the same degree of equality as everybody else. Uh, how do we do that? Well, they said, well, disability must relate to a thing they called essential function. 
another word they invent, a group of words they invented. Essential function is what you have to be able to do to do a particular job, whatever actions are necessary. And they said then, if you make a, accommodate that by going for something which they called reasonable accommodation, add reasonable accommodation uh, to disability and you get ability. So it is a very simple equation that they created. Now that equation has run through all legislation. It came into the European Directive 2078 EC, uh, which is the directive in relation to employment, which, uh, which applies throughout Europe, uh, and on which, in fact, our legislation, particularly the 1998-2004 uh, Employment Equality Acts, are based. And that within, within, those, uh, within those acts, then you must, an employer must provide reasonable accommodation, but the problem with the 1998 Act was that it could only be at nominal expense if it didn't cost him anything. When the directive, and the reason for that was because the, High Court, the Supreme Court held that it was contrary to the Constitution, it attacked the rights of employers to require them to fund this. Uh, however, when it came in, in under the European Directive that uh, it was to be without disproportionate burden to the, the employer, which is a much higher level of uh, requirement, then that could be brought in. And the 2004 uh, Employment Equality Act brought in those words, changed it to bring in those words. So it places a burden on the employer to, in fact, provide reasonable accommodation. Now, that brought us then to 1998. 1999, the National Disability uh, the, the Act was uh, was, estab was established, which in fact establishes the, the, the National Disability Authority and gives it, um, as Siobhan has earlier said, its two primary functions. One is to advise the government and to formulate, if you like, uh, or to assist the government in the formulation of policy. And the second is to create standards uh, and to inform the public, in other words, to promote the process. Now, statutes can act as a catalyst in this. In other words, once an idea is ready to happen, a statute can be brought in, as I outlined it earlier. Positive statutes and negative statutes can be brought in in order to make something happen. In the year 2000, we brought in the Equal Status, the, Equal, the Equality Act, as we call it, and that under that, there was a requirement for all employers, and in fact, all persons, sorry, not employers, all persons providing services to the public, whether for, whether for benefit or not, to make their premises accessible. Uh, and to provide, if you like, a level of access to their premises that would make the service accessible. Sorry, I should have said service, not premises. And one must, one must remember that throughout all the legislation here in all nationalities, it is the service that must be accessible. An illustration of that, quite a good illustration of it, is a solicitor in England who was sued under the UK 1995 Act uh, because his premises was inaccessible, showed that written on his notepaper, he had a provision that he was available for consultation anywhere at any time and that that was deemed to make his service accessible. So the premises doesn't have to be. Now, in some cases, of course, it does have to be. And in the case of the 2005 Act, as you will see, public buildings must be made accessible where they can be made accessible, uh, and that that's a different requirement. But the general requirement is carried under the Equal Status Act. This is a negative piece of legislation because what it doesn't allow you to discriminate. It says that if, in fact, you don't provide uh, reasonable accommodation, that constitutes discrimination and you have offended against the Act by discriminating. Now, that's not a rights-based Act as such, because if you have a complaint under that, you, 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 the Minister, the head of the Government Department, must appoint an inquiry officer, and the inquiry officer can make recommendations and so forth. But it's, it's, that's, that's under the, sorry, mix, under the Equal Status Act, the Equality Authority appoints a, an inquiry officer and undertakes an investigation and makes a recommendation and will take the matter to court itself if it sees fit. Uh, whereas if we move on then quickly to the, the 2005 Act, which is the one that you're primarily here to consider today, that, what that does is it, it makes all public, uh, uh, it extends to all public buildings and all public ventures, including, including in fact buildings which are within tax regimes whereby a benefit is derived which is deemed to be an indirect benefit through the state. Uh, such as the 482 schemes and so on, that these, these are brought within the scope of it. So any scheme that's funded from public revenue or derives a benefit from public revenue comes within the scope of the 2005 Act. The 2005 Act is a very interesting Act. Now, I should say before going to that that the English 1995 Act is a traditional English Act, and what it does is it creates a thing called a statutory tort, which means that any person who is disadvantaged as a result of not being able to access a service can take an action against the provider of the service and can, as a result of infringement of dignity, which is a statutory tort, can recover 
uh, compensation up to a certain level for that, if you like, infringement of their dignity. Uh, and th this, this is the way the English Act goes, so that the individual who is offended takes action against the, 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 per the person who offends. Under the, Irish, under the provisions of the, of the Irish Act, the 2005 Act, uh, we have a completely different structure. First of all, it's basically an enabling act, and that it operates, first of all, under sectoral plans. It divides, there are six departments which are cover, government departments which are covered by it. Education is covered separately. Uh, and that these departments must prepare sectoral plans, and that sectoral plans must be prioritised. They're laid before the, before the government. The minister for the, that particular department reports on an annual basis to the Oireachtas. It is actually policed by the Oireachtas, which is unusual. It's not policed by any subordinate body, but by the Oireachtas itself. So that the, Oireachtas, the minister has to stand up and show what he hasn't, hasn't achieved in terms of the priorities that he set out for the sectoral plan for that particular year. And that in this process, there's a slow progression whereby through that, that act, which is still basically, it's a double-sided act, it's both negative and positive. On the negative side of the act, what's happened is that he has to bring existing facilities into line. The way he's to do this is to take part M of the building regulations and he's to bring them up to part M by 2015 or to any amendment after 1997 of 2000 and M within 10 years of that amendment being introduced. So that that keeps a flow in, in relation to a slow progressive change within the physical structures of government departments to make the services accessible. Uh, by the same token that in relation to new build, all new buildings, all new buildings then of course are to conform with the Building Control Act. And this is the positive side of the legislation. If we take the, the d discrimination as being the negative side, the positive side is going to be the Building Control Act, which is going to require that all buildings introduced, or all buildings built after the introduction of the Act, uh, and in, will be built in, in accordance with the standards which are laid down under the Act. This is a very important element then of the 2000 Act, if we come back to it for the moment, is the centre of excellence. That the centre of excellence is unusual. This is the first time this has ever appeared in statutory form that I've been able to find a centre of excellence where a state, a state undertakes to provide a service, an ongoing or rolling service in relation to a developing area of knowledge or technology where it continually feeds in and gives ministerial status of approval to standards and codes and that the codes at the time, whatever they are at the time, will represent the obligation. So the compliance is required to comply with the codes at the times of approval. So that all, you have a continuous rolling process. The big disadvantage of the American with Disability Act, there is the most magnificent schedule attached to it. It's like a telephone directory. It covers every conceivable possibility in terms of design solutions. But it's a rigid set of regulations that have to be followed and they were out of date within a year. Uh, of being introduced. So in fact America has slipped back as a result of that. England brought in the British standard and as you know the British standards tend to be very good but they're not updated very often because the British Standards Authority has too much to do. So Ireland has brought in this unique uh, and extremely interesting mechanism which is done through the National Disability Authority where the centre of excellence will on a rolling basis taking into account representatives of the disabled, taking into account the professional bodies that are specialised in the matter and taking into account all other interests and itself, of course, will in fact generate and keep on a rolling base. It will do national and international research. It will carry out projects and it will develop in a positive way. This is an extraordinary development and is extraordinarily important. Now, if you look at go going back to um, the, the idea of universal design, this will underlie it all. And I, I don't have time to do it now, but I, I, I'm close to, close to having to finish. But if you go back, one of the big problems we have as designers, just to focus on this for one moment, is that if we go back to Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci, with his circles and his squares and his ratios and his man that stands like that, produced the perfect man. And this was the module. And all design, post-Renaissance design, is based on that module. That module doesn't exist. Uh, and that's the problem. You can't design to a single standard. Universal design is, in fact, the opposite. It's saying there's no such thing as a universal man. There, is, there are a huge number, range of people, and that they range from disability to abilities of different descriptions, and that design can be widened. It's only a question of mindset. Design can be widened to incorporate this. The fact, for example, take a simple one, the width of a door. It doesn't cost any more to do it. It's a mindset in not doing it. The, the going of a stairs is a mindset. It's a designer's mindset. And that what this is all about, and these are all catalysts to achieve it, it's about changing the mindset of designers. It's about changing the prejudices of people. 
It's about moving this circle, and I come back to Montesquieu's circle, it's moving Montesquieu's circle out by another layer and saying these people are welcomed into the human race of citizens defined by Aristotle as people who have in fact a born, are born with a right to express themselves. And all this does is it gives them the opportunity, whether they take it or not is up to them, it gives them the opportunity to do it. And that the Americans have influenced Europe, they've influenced England, but we have, we have certainly used their language, but we have thought out a new scheme. We have a progressive scheme. It's actually an extraordinarily interesting scheme. I haven't come across anything like it, and it brings in a lot of unique ideas within both the statutory mechanisms and the, 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 the principles that underlie it. It's, need, it. it's fundamentally romantic if you go back to the two great divisions of the 19th century on the basis it recognizes the individual and it gives primacy to the individual within that changing flux of events in which we all live, which we probably all recognize. We do not control the world outside by the same token uh, we, 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 we have to acknowledge in relation to each other that if I have a right to something, you have an equal right. The only thing that restricts my right to absolute freedom is your right to the same thing. And that once we both recognize that and we have that standing between us, then in fact we form a society, we form a modern civilized society. And that basically is where Ireland has got to in relation to disability. Now, uh, I, I haven't time, I think I have to finish now. I've got, I've got the sign I have to finish. What I was going to talk about but was just this whole issue of heritage buildings uh, and protected structures in relation to disability. And I was going to just merely say that this starts with America. America got it right the first time around. They simply said that if you protect a structure because it has some particular feature in relation to it, and if you change that feature to make it accessible, well, then you have nothing left to protect. Now, that's the basic principle that has come through in the first of the new uh, codes. I'm not sure if it's the first of the new codes, but certainly in the new code in relation to heritage structures that has been approved by the Minister and has now reached the status under, under Section 30 of the Act as an approved code. Uh, it's excellently, excellently presented on the basis it has these little windows that simply give you the principle. It then gives you an elaboration of that if you want to see examples underneath it. You can read it in about three minutes from end to end it's very sensible, and that it merely recognises that principle, which is the interesting one of saying, you're not allowed to do anything under this Act which was not permissible under the law before it. And since the planning authority don't allow modification of a protected structure where the significance is relevant, then this Act doesn't change it by definition. And that that is recognised in that instrument, which again is very succinctly and well put together. So I think it's a very good example of where the, 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 the National Disability Authority is going in performing its function. It's an excellent starting point, an excellent example, and I think the professions in general, design professions, look forward to seeing a lot more of this and to embedding into their own culture and their own subsense. And indeed, since 2001, under the Council of Europe, the, all of the educational establishments have undertaken to teach universal design. Uh, and that in relation to that, once universal designers come on board, then all of this will fade away. It's a little bit like the green movement. Once everybody embraces it, there's no longer any need for it because it's become part of us and that the admission of this category of people into the circle of citizenry uh, is what has been achieved through the Disability Act. And that really is what I would say our disability institutions and our obligations are all about. Thank you very much.